Okay, so our video lecture for today is going to be over the nutrients packet that you received. So the last time that we had a face-to-face -face meeting, um, I left two packets for you, one over the digestive system, which we covered last time, and then this is going to be over the nutrient side of things. So the big focus with digestion in that first conversation was not only to learn the parts, but what they do for the body, because they do have very specific tasks that they, they carry out. It was also to get an understanding that digestion is not just about putting food into your body, but about taking that food and decomposing it, breaking it down into a level where we can actually tap into the benefits of that. Because as the food goes in, there is no way our body can use it. Everything is bonded together within those food molecules in a way that we can't access it. And it's not arranged in a way that works for us. So digestion is taking that food, breaking it apart into its individual components, and then taking those individual parts and reassembling them into the structures that our body needs. So when we talk about having a balanced diet, that is crucial because we need to be able to build and manufacture those things that we need for our body to be able to carry out all the jobs that it does on a daily basis. So we covered that in the last conversation. Today, we're going to move forward and look at the nutrient side of things and how that kind of plays into the picture. So if you have your packet or if you have to go grab it, uh, get it now and you can jot down any notes that you want to as we go through um, this conversation. First slide just talks about the macronutrient, macronutrients that we have uh, within the body. And the one thing to understand is that when we talk about calories, calories come from three sources and that's it. There are other nutrients that we take into our body that our body needs, but they don't carry any caloric value with them. So when we look at calories, calories are going to come from carbohydrates, they're going to come from lipids, and they're going to come from proteins. Those are the only three places. When we talk about calcium and vitamin A and vitamin C and all of those, um, no calories are associated with those. So when we look at those macronutrients, carbohydrates are going to carry approximately four grams. So there's four grams of carbohydrates, um, excuse me, four calories for every one gram of carbohydrates. And when we look at proteins, again, we are going to be four calories for every one gram. And then when we get to lipids, lipids are much higher than that. And if you look at the value on it, you're looking at just over nine calories for every one gram. So it's more than double the calories that you get from carbohydrates or the calories that you get from proteins. Now in looking at those three sources, most of you probably don't remember a time when there were not labels on food packages, but that used to not be something that you could pick up a food package and see. You had the advertising, you had the pictures and all of that on your food package, but there was a point in time where there was nothing about the nutritional value. You had no idea how many calories were in it. You had no idea what the ingredients were. That was not required to be on the packaging. And so a lot of them didn't have it. And as different laws have been passed and things like that, that is something that we have become very familiar with. It's required to be on all food packages now. But like I said, wasn't always the, the case. So when we look at those food labels, there are three main requirements that they have to have on there. They have to tell you how many carbohydrates, they have to tell you how many proteins, they have to tell you how many lipids, because those are the three places where your calories are coming from. A lot of labels will include other nutritional inf information just because most people are looking to see now what vitamins, what minerals they're getting from that food. So they will include that because they know that it's boosting the chance that they will sell their product, more vitamins and other things that they have present in it. With that labeling, you also kind of have to be careful. And when you look at it, there are not specific um, definitions as to how things have to be defined. So when you look at serving size, that is something that varies greatly from one company to the next. They determine what a serving size is. So they can make the calories look like they're a little bit on the low side, but if the calories or their serving size um, has to be multiplied out four or five times to get to how many servings are actually in that one package. 
Um, so people have to be careful when they're looking at that. They just can't look at how many calories are listed on there, but they have to also make sure that they understand that the serving size, potentially you could have several servings in one particular package and that that needs to be multiplied out to actually find um, how much you're taking in in one sitting. With the micronutrients, as I already mentioned, those are not going to be a calorie source. So when we get into our minerals, when we get into our vitamins, those are going to be considered your micronutrients. And the last one that's on there, it talks about essential nutrients. There are some things that we cannot produce within our bodies, and so they have to come from an outside source. And this is, again, why we talk about having a balanced diet and eating a variety of foods because different foods are going to carry different nutritional value with them. And the wider range of foods that you are providing your body, the more likely it is that you are going to cover all of the different nutrients that you need to get into your system on a daily basis. The other thing to consider is when we talk about our diet and we look at nutrition, that even though you put food into your body, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are tapping into all the benefits of that food. And there are cases where as that food is digested for whatever reason, it will pass through the entire digestive system and leave the body uh, without ever being absorbed into our system. And so you have to be very careful about how you are managing your diet. A lot of times people will talk about having several small meals throughout the day. That is much more beneficial than maybe just having one big meal uh, one time a day. And the reason for that is as that food moves through our digestive system, as I said, you might not be able to pull out all of the nutritional value. So if you're only giving your body one chance a day to access that nutrition and some of that gets bypassed, you're not necessarily getting everything that you think that you are. So putting several small meals into your body, now your body is getting five, six chances a day to get to that nutrition, pull it out and actually put it into your body. The other thing that we have to be careful of is vitamins. A lot of times people will take a multivitamin, has 100% of everything that they need um, on the label. But again, if you're taking that vitamin, there's a very good chance that a lot of the nutritional value that is packed in that vitamin is actually going to leave the body and never be absorbed. So even though it gives you the potential of having 100% of that enter your body, that doesn't mean that it's actually making it into your system. So some people have horrible diets and they think because they take that multivitamin once a day that they're getting everything that they need and they don't understand that there's a good chance that a lot of it is going to pass through their system and they are not going to get the benefit from it. So looking at the second slide talks about carbohydrates and the reason that we talk about carbohydrates first, a couple of reasons. Number one, it is the first thing that's going to get digested in your system. So when you guys eat anything that is carbohydrate based, as soon as it hits your mouth, that amylase, that digestive enzyme will begin to coat the food that's in your mouth and anything that is a sugar or anything that is a starch is going to begin to get digested. Now, when we talk about digestion, you want to think about bonds in that food that you have put into your body. It is bonded together. And when we talk about digestion, what we mean is that those bonds that are holding that food together are now going to be severed and they are going to get broken down and it's going to release the molecules of that food, whatever it is, breaking it down into smaller pieces so that you guys can access those materials that make up that particular food. So amylase comes into our mouth through our salivary glands. That sal saliva gets coated and worked into the food uh, just by moving the food around, using the tongue to move it around, and it will coat those sugars and starches and start the process of breaking them down as soon as it gets into your mouth. So that transitions into the availability of those calories from carbohydrates. We burn through carbohydrate calories first. And so anything that you put into your body that is a carbohydrate, you will burn through those calories. Once those are depleted, then you will move on to other calorie sources. With the last slide that you guys have on page one, it talks about some of the places where you guys will get carbohydrates. And when we look at carbohydrates, we have simple sugars. So things that are quick sugars, like your cookies, your candies, things like that, um, those are going to be our simple sugars. They are short molecules. So they're kind of, they're chains 
but you don't have these huge chains that are made up of hundreds of parts. And so they're much faster and easier to break down, which is why we call them simple sugars. Starches, on the other hand, starches are still carbohydrates, but they are complex because they are going to be much longer in size. So you have a lot more molecules involved. It takes a lot more time to break all those down just because of the sheer number of them. And so starches are a little bit more involved. When you hear about people that are carbohydrate loading, carbohydrate loading is not eating simple sugars. So it's not eating a candy bar. It's not eating a cookie. That will get you quick energy for about 20 to 30 minutes in duration after you eat that high sugary food. When people talk about carbohydrate loading, they are going for those starches because carbohydrate loading is geared towards getting you through an activity that is going to be over an extended period of time. So because those carbohydrate or those starches are so much longer and it takes so much longer to break them down, every time that one of those bonds is broken, releases energy into the body and you can use that energy. So they are much more long-term than your simple sugars. All right, if you flip over to page two, um, at the top of page two, it talks about carbohydrate use. And the one thing that I want you guys to pay attention to is when you look at the names of carbohydrates, all sorts of carbohydrates, you have glucose, you have fructose, sucrose, uh, galactose, maltose. If you look at those lists, tons of different types of sugars. That O-S-E ending. So if you have a molecule and it ends in O-S-E, that is a very good indication to you that you are talking about a sugar. Okay. If it ends in ASE, now you are looking at an enzyme that is used in the body. So a little bit difference in spelling, but it makes a huge difference in the molecule that you're dealing with. So just know to recognize that OSE as being an indicator that you are dealing with a sugar of some sort. The second one gets into lipids. Uh, most people refer to lipids as fats. Fats are going to be our second source of energy. So if in a given day you burn through all of your carbohydrate calories, now you're going to start burning off those lipids. So a lot of diets that are out there right now, uh, that is what their focus is. Their focus is to reduce the number of carbohydrates uh, that you take in in a given day. And so if you don't have a lot of carbohydrates coming in, you burn through those very quickly, you immediately go to those lipids and start burning off those lipids. And so they're designed in that fashion. But lipids, like I said, they are our second or secondary source of energy. So you have to get through all those carbs first and then you get into the lipids themselves. Remember, lipids are going to carry over two times the calories per grams that we see with carbohydrates um, as well as with proteins. And with the lipids, that is typically why people, when they do try and lose weight, they do something to attack or deal with those fats. So whether you're doing a low carb, so you immediately get into burning through the fats, or you reduce the number of fats you're taking in in the first place. Because they have such a higher calorie count associated with them, that tends to be where people go when they're looking for weight losses to really target uh, those lipids. The last one that it talks about is the protein side of things. And while protein do carry calories with them, the one thing that you need to understand is that the body really does not ever want to use proteins as a calorie source. And the reason for that is proteins are so vital to structural material in the body that we don't wanna to have to devote any of it to anything other than building material. So the only time that we really go to burning proteins as a calorie source is going to be when there is something severe that is going on, whether somebody is purposely de depriving themselves of food or if there is another reason why they can't get to food. But when we talk about those proteins, understand that it is a calorie source coming in, but the body does not actually want to have to burn proteins to get calories to keep or to get energy to keep us going. Once those proteins come into our body, we want to be able to devote them to building new muscle, to building organelles, to building DNA, and all of the other structural material that we have in the body. A lot of times when you have somebody that is suffering from an eating disorder, it's not uncommon to have somebody that is very young in their late teens or early 20s 
that has problems going into cardiac arrest because they have had a battle or an issue with an eating disorder. And that is because they suppress their calorie intake so low that they, just through doing normal daily activities, they burn through all of their carb calories, they burn through all of their fat calories, and the body has no choice but to then tap into proteins as an energy source to keep them going. And if it's not getting those calories, there's nothing coming in, what the body will do is it will tap into existing proteins. And so it will start breaking down muscle tissue and accessing the proteins that way and getting to the calories to keep the body going. Well, if you think about that, the heart is a muscle. And if your body is having to go back and destroy muscle tissue to get energy, it could potentially be doing that to the heart muscle. And over time, if that heart muscle is weakened because it is getting stripped of its muscle tissue, obviously it will get to a point where it can't do its job. And you have these, these very young people going into cardiac arrest because of it. All right. If you flip over to page three, at the top of page three, um, it talks about a little bit more about proteins. And with proteins, the building block of a protein is what we call an amino acid. So you have, if you kind of think of a puzzle type design, you open up a puzzle, you have all the individual little pieces and you have to take those individual pieces and link them together. And when you link them together, you get the puzzle as a whole. That's the finished product. When we talk about proteins, they start out as these little individual amino acids, like the little individual puzzle pieces. Our body links the amino acids together in the correct sequence, and that will ultimately build a protein. So the sequence of amino acids that is going to create muscle tissue is different than the sequence that might be used to build an organelle or build part of your cell membrane or build some other protein structure within the body. So the amino acids, there are different amino acids out there. We are able to produce about half of those amino acids in our body, but the other ones we can't produce. We have to get them into the foods that we eat. And so it goes back again to that balanced diet and eating multiple times throughout the day so that you are giving yourself a chance to get the right foods that are going to bring those additional amino acids into our body that we naturally cannot produce or cannot make. The middle slide on page three talks about energy use in the body. And I kind of already talked about this a little bit, uh, just to know that we go through carbohydrates first, then we go through lipids, and only in extreme situations would we tap into those proteins as being an energy source for us. Okay. Talks a little bit about your metabolic rate um, abbreviation there you have is the BMR. And this just looks at how your body is going to work through the energy um, that is provided to it. And when we look at BMR, kind of like metabolism, it's going to vary from one person to the next. So gender is going to be a difference between BMRs. Uh, you also have age, how physically active you are. All of those things are going to impact those numbers. And so it's not one set number that you can apply to a gender or anything like that because there are so many different variables, variables that are involved uh, with that BMR. The last slide on page three talks about maintaining weight. And when we talk or look at maintaining weight, if you have a certain number of calories coming in based on what you do with those calories throughout the day is going to determine what happens with your weight. So calories in versus calories burned off, if that is equal, then you are going to maintain your current weight. If you are bringing more calories in than you are burning off, those excess calories are not going to just be lost. So any calories that you take in are then going to be stored if they're not burned, burned off. And so the other scenario would be that you take in less calories than what you burn off. And in that case, your body is now going to have to tap into any fat reserves that you have and use those backup calories to keep the body going on a given day. So three different ways it can go. More in than out, you're going to gain weight. Same in, same out, you're going to maintain. And less in, 
then out or less coming in, more being burned off, you would lose weight. Typically, you're looking at about 3,700 calories that need to be burned off in excess in order to see a weight loss of about one pound. So if you look at that roughly, if you cut about 500 calories a day, you can then expect to have about one pound of weight loss every single week. And so just managing your calories, knowing how many calories in versus how many calories out can kind of help um, that process of maintaining your weight and making sure that you're not putting on any pounds that you don't want to. If you flip over to page four, um, page four gets into the vitamins and it carries over into page five. So looking at the fat soluble vitamins and your water soluble vitamins. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about this all collectively. So we're going to move through kind of the next four or five slides um, together. So looking at the, the vitamins, a lot of times vitamins get a letter designation, so vitamin A, B, C, D, E, K, and they were actually named in the order that they were discovered. So the first vitamin that was found was vitamin A. The vitamin B complexes, we get vitamin B1, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, you get the number designation because they basically do a lot of the same things. There's small variations between them, but because they pretty much carry out the same type of function, they are in the same group. And so they did all get the B classification. You'll notice that there are some holes. Um, so there are some letters that we don't have within our vitamin alphabet, so to speak. And the reason for that is in the discovery process, there was at one point a vitamin F. And as we learned more about nutrition and we learned more about the molecules, it was discovered that it was not a true vitamin. And so it was dropped from the vitamin list. So that's why we have vitamin A, we get all the way to vitamin K, but there's not every letter in between. And that's because at one point there was, it's been determined since that it was not actually a vitamin and it was dropped from the list. And that explains the holes in the naming of the vitamins. So we have what are known as the fat soluble vitamins, and that's going to be vitamin A, D, E, and K. So for those four vitamins, what that means is that if you have too much on a daily basis, that it can actually get absorbed into your tissues. Now, fat soluble indicating that it is absorbed into your fat tissue, but it can be absorbed in other tissues as well. So it's not just specifically fat, but it's telling you that that can be held within the tissues of your body. And so when we look at fat soluble vitamins, the one concern that we have, if you have too much of these vitamins and it being stored in your system, you can actually have adverse effects from that. So kind of like you can overdose on certain things, you can in a way overdose on these particular vitamins and get adverse side effects because you have too much in your system. When we look at vitamin A, uh, vitamin A is very real in its ability to help with your eyesight. So if your mom ever told you to eat your carrots because it would help your eyesight, uh, she was correct. Now, a lot of times in foods, vitamin A is going to be identified as beta carotene because that's the form it's in when it is in a food source. Once we eat it, we pretty much immediately convert it over into vitamin A. So if you see beta carotene, it is going to be vitamin A. Uh, then you have vitamin D. Vitamin D is something that we actually have to have exposure to the sun. And so we talk a lot about ultraviolet rays and all of that, but to a certain degree, you do have to have exposure to the sun so that we can convert, again, molecules that are present in our body and transition them into vitamin D so we can use it. Now, vitamin D is linked to a hormone in the body known as serotonin, and serotonin is a hormone that is connected to your mood. The more serotonin, the better your mood. So when we get into the winter months, especially in places like here in Iowa, where it gets very cold, we spend a lot of time indoors. We spend a lot of time, even though we might go outside, we're covered up. We get very little exposure to the sun. What happens is we don't produce as much vitamin D. We're not getting that sun exposure. We're not converting those molecules over to vitamin D. And if our vitamin D levels go down, then that means our serotonin levels will decrease as well and your mood is going to go with it. So seasonal affective disorder is a very real thing because of that connection between vitamin D levels 
and the hormone that will impact your mood overall. So not advocating for tanning beds. There are other ways to get vitamin D into your system. You will see more and more foods are being fortified with it. Foods don't naturally have vitamin D in them. So if you're picking up orange juice or you're picking up milk and it says it has vitamin D in it, it's been artificially placed there because it's just an easier means sometimes to getting that vitamin D in there. But it's not naturally occurring in milk. It's not naturally occurring in orange juice or cereals um, or any of those places. Then you have vitamin E. Uh, vitamin E is going to have a role in your skin health uh, and things of that nature. A lot of times if you have an injury that could potentially scar, they'll tell you to take the vitamin E capsules, like the gel ones, break those open and rub it on the scar just to help the healing and repair process. And so a lot of what vitamin E does is that healing, that skin health, um, maintaining the cells that make up your skin structure. And then we have vitamin K. Vitamin K is going to assist in blood clotting. So you typically get this from foods and vegetables that are going to be deep green, leafy greens, uh, kale, spinach, things of that nature. And vitamin K, like I said, will help the blood clot. So you have good vitamin K levels. The clotting of your blood when you have a wound, um, a scrape or a cut, something like that is going to be much better than somebody who has lower vitamin K. There are other factors that work into blood clotting, so that's not the only thing uh, that you have to consider, but it is one of the factors. If you flip over to page five, uh, page five gets into the water solubles. And with the water solubles, I wish that table was a little bit larger. Uh, you do have a table uh, in the textbook as well. So if you want to see it on a little bit larger scale, um, like I said, you have that available to you through your text. With the water solubles, you have the B vitamins. And as I said, uh, those all get grouped together because they play some sort of role in the functional metabolism. So how your cells are working through um, the calories and things like that, uh, that you have provided them. Um, and if you look with the B vitamins, there is a group of six and they get the number designations. So you have your B1s, your B2s all through um, that B class. And again, if you can't see the descriptions well on the packet, which I would imagine is pretty difficult, uh, go ahead and look in your textbook and you can work through all of those Bs. Um, cereals are typically a good place to get your B vitamins. Um, so if usually just an easy way or place for people to get those uh, Bs into, into their body. Vitamin C. Vitamin C is going to play a role in immunity, uh, helping to keep your cells healthy, helping to keep you healthy. Um, and vitamin C's are typically going to be found in your citrus fruits. So your oranges, lemons, limes, pineapples, things like that. Very good place to, to find those. Um, within that list, you also have your folic acid. Uh, folic acid has a huge role in DNA formation. And so a lot of times if you are trying to get pregnant or you're anticipating that you're going to be pregnant, they will up your folic acid intake. Folic acid in a developing embryo, because of how it helps with DNA formation, is very crucial. And so they'll increase your folic acid prior to getting pregnant and then through the pregnancy. Um, with the prenatal vitamins, they are slightly different than a typical daily vitamin because they will increase the amount of folic acid. And the problem with increasing the folic acid levels to the rate that they do is it actually will make, one of the side effects is that it makes you nauseous. So some people actually have difficulty taking a typical prenatal vitamin because those higher levels of folic acid um, make them ill. And it also can easily be mistaken for morning sickness because once you find out you're pregnant, you typically will get put on a prenatal and it's right about that time that you might also be experiencing morning sickness as well. Then you have biotin, which is within that group of water solubles. Uh, the thing with biotin is that biotin is readily available in most foods that you eat. And so if you are, again, having that well spread out diet um, and you are eating a variety of foods, biotin is usually pretty easy to get into your system. 
When we look at the water solubles, water solubles mean that we do not maintain or carry over any. So within a 24 hour period, if you were to have more fat soluble vitamins in your diet than what you needed, that gets stored into your tissue to be used at a later time. With water solubles, if you would have more than what you need, those will actually get flushed out of your body. And the next time that you go to the restroom, they will leave. And so they don't stay with you. Very, very difficult to overdose on your water solubles. Not impossible, but it's much harder to do because they are getting flushed out of the body on a regular system, on a regular basis. The last part of the packet gets into the different minerals. And I'm not going to go into the minerals specifically, uh, but just to know that you have two different classes of minerals. And again, the tables are rather small. Um, if you want to look at them in a little bit bigger um, scale, these are also in your textbook as well. But you have two different groups. You have the major minerals and then you have the trace minerals. And the major ones are just those that you need to have in larger percentages throughout the day uh, to keep your body functioning at the level that it needs to. The trace elements are going to be used on a much smaller scale. Still need to have them, but just not in high, as high of a percentage as what we see with the major minerals. So you can see the designation between those two. The last part of the packet uh, talks about uh, malnutrition and starvation. Uh, with malnutrition, you're looking at a situation, and again, it can be for a variety of reasons. It can be self-inflicted. It could just be lack of food that is available. Um, but it's going to be when you don't have the nutrition available to you that you need. And your body does a lot of amazing things to keep you going for as long as, as, po as possible. Um, we have things that are naturally stored in our body that we will tap into, but obviously that will only get us so far. Um, and then the body will start to shut down. But malnutrition just simply means that you are not getting the nutrients into your system at the level that you need to to function at an appropriate level. And the last one, starvation. Um, starvation is, and most people are very familiar with the term, um, but starvation is just simply when your body is having to tap into reserves and like I said, those body parts that have already been formed in order to get the nutrition and the energy that it needs to keep going. Um, when you are trying to, or if you are trying to lose weight, one of the mistakes that people make is they want weight loss to be very quick. They want to see results immediately. And so they go to these extreme drastic measures in order to drop weight. Typically, healthy weight loss is going to be somewhere between one to two pounds a week. And if you are cutting weight faster than that, your body actually reads it as there's not food available. And so your body will start to do internal changes to conserve what you do have. A lot of the things that happen within our body are still hardwired back to caveman era. And at that point in time, they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. They had to go out and hunt their food and track it down. And there wasn't always a lot of food available. And so our body kind of works on that same concept. If you deprive your body of food, it believes that you're without food, you don't have access to food. And so, like I said, it will start to make internal changes to conserve everything that you do have. So when you have these drastic changes, when you cut your calories uh, very, very low, less than 1200 a day, your body will roll into starvation mode, naturally drops your metabolism. And as soon as you drop your metabolism, you make it more difficult to lose weight. So you're actually working against yourself. And in the beginning, people might see success with that, but over the long period, you hear stories all the time about somebody who dropped an amazing amount of weight. And then as soon as they stopped what they were doing and they went back to just a normal or a typical diet, not only did they put the weight back on, but a lot of times they put more weight on. And what happened was their body went into that starvation mode, suppressed and lowered their metabolism. So when they went back to eating normal, the weight came back on and then they were not working at a typical level to burn things off. And so their body is now conserving as much of that food intake as it can and storing it as excess weight. So you have to be very careful about weight loss. We are definitely a population of quick results. We wanna see those instant changes, but the body doesn't work that way. 
and you can't make it work any, any different than how it is geared to work. And so you're just kind of fighting against yourself um, if you're attempting to, to do it any quicker than that or in a different manner than that. Um, like I said, fad diets, everybody knows of different fad diets, have heard of different fad diets, um, but that's typically why they are known as fad diets. Quick results in the beginning, uh, but they are not long lasting. So with the conclusion of this video, we are going to have an assignment that will be posted. Um, everybody is going to do the same type of assignment, but you are going to have a specific focus um, as an individual, and that will be posted um, by the end of the day tomorrow. If you have any questions on that, please let me know.